Uh, Caitlin's interest in insects began in her backyard when she was a toddler, searching for beetles and caterpillars, and later, after moving to eastern Washington, she narrowed her focus to butterflies. She has a BA in Geography from Central Washington University and an MS in Environmental Science from Washington State University at Vancouver and currently works as a GIS analyst. In her spare time, she studies and photographs local butterflies and works on various butterfly projects. She recently self-published two books, Pocket Guide to the Butterflies of Washington and Butterflies of the Sin Mohican Wildlife Area, and she is co-authoring Another field guide, Butterflies of the Pacific Northwest with Robert Michael Pyle, due out in March or April of next year. I think April is the official. So, so who's, okay. who's that other guy? I uh, remember <laughs> a guy named Pyle. Pyle. P I L E, right? P I L E. So you're on the right track. You may have heard of him. Uh, tonight's talk is in two parts. First, a synopsis of her experience acquiring selecting and processing photos for field guides. In particular, the Butterflies of the Pacific Northwest has already been, as already mentioned, co-authored with Bob Pyle, as well as her own book, Butterflies of the Sin Lake and Wildlife. Second, she will share some tips on how to record data and an overview of different mapping methods. So with that, okay. Yeah. 
I was just going to say in that previous public, uh, all of the pictures, all the pictures were 35 millimeter slides, and so they all had to be scanned. Yeah. Uh, so we had to digital pictures now. We have more quality. Yeah, that's like Bob thinks that that's probably one of the last field guides that was made with the slides. So and that was another thing that we ran into. Timber Press um, had several qualifications for what photos they would allow in the book, and so they had to be at least 300 dpi resolution, they had to be two megabytes or bigger. We were able to slide a few in that were smaller because we couldn't get anything better than that, or it was something that showed a real special uh, characteristic of a butterfly, and so we told them, we want this in there no matter what. Um, they also didn't want to allow any iPhone, you know, any camera pictures, uh, camera phone pictures. Um, so there are a few things like that that we had to follow. Anyway, um, then with my book, I have a library of over 9,000 butterfly pictures, um, almost all of Washington, and so I went through all of those and chose as many as I could from Simlahican. There's a few filled in from other parts of Oklahoma County and uh, Kittitas County mostly. And I wound up with 370 live photos, 691 specimens in the book. So there's a lot of photos in that book. And 145 habitat or plant photos. So one of the things, like Dave mentioned, when they first did Cascadia, we just had the uh, 35 millimeter slides to deal with, but these days, with the advent of technology, there's a lot of sources out there, and so many people have become photographers, there's a lot more photos to choose from. Which in some ways can make it easier to find what you're looking for, but in other ways it can make it a little difficult because there's so much to weed through, it's hard to decide what picture to use when you can only choose one. Um, so Flickr is a really big source. Um, I spent a lot of time on there, and met quite a few new people um, through that and through the chat groups that I put announcements out on. So that was something fun for me during this project is getting to meet a lot more people and getting to know um, other butterfly enthusiasts in the area. Um, the one problem I ran into on Flickr is that it's very difficult to figure out contact information on there. So if you find a picture you want to use, if you can't figure out how to get a hold of the person, then you can't use it. Um, so that, that was a little tricky. Um, also, I uh, did a lot of searches online looking for blogs and websites. Um, a lot of people have their own website where they post all their pictures on there, so I got some that way. Okay, one of the things I thought was very interesting in this project is getting to look at all these photos from all these different people. I started noticing some interesting trends. And some, some was expected, so, you know, if there's a butterfly that is very uncommon and it's only found in one area of the state, like the Melissa Arctic or, um, you know, common branded skippers found in, up around Hurricane Ridge and then very high elevations in North Cascades, you would expect those to be hard to find pictures of because not a lot of people seek those out and go to those places to take pictures of them. Uh, others were more unexpected, and I'll get to one of those in a minute. So as I mentioned, common branded skipper, this was actually the hardest one to find pictures of. So if any of you want to get pictures of something that's not common out there, go find these guys. Um, <laughs> this is probably the best picture we wound up with, I think, um, by Rod Gilbert, and I had um, Several very, very small resolution fuzzy pictures, I think, were camera phone pictures, but we wound up using a couple of those because we had nothing else. Um, and I think two reasons. One, like I said, it's a hard butterfly to get to. It's only in a few spots. Um, they're also very small and hard to approach, and so they can be very difficult to photograph. And because they're small, a lot of times they go unnoticed. So several reasons there. And another one, like I mentioned, is Melissa Arctic. This is Dave's picture. And this is the only picture we got of Melissa Arctic, and it's going to be in the book. Um, and then we wanted a dorsal shot, so we wound up using a specimen of the photo. So we have this, I think it's a female, right, Dave? That's the one that escaped out of my cage and went right through the back door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so we got that nice 
Yeah, it's now a colony of Lissardics in this part, right? <laughs> 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 okay, yeah, and then, Now the one that was not so expected were cabbage whites. Nobody takes pictures of cabbage whites. <laughs> oh man, I, I was like, this is like the most common butterfly, and they're everywhere. But they're invasive, and they're everywhere, so they're boring, and people don't care to take pictures of them. They want to take no, pictures of the pretty stuff. Even if they weren't. Yeah, and so you know, if you're looking for pictures of them in general, there's a lot out there, but. Um, Bob and I were trying to select pictures that were only from Washington and Oregon because we wanted to stay true to the nature of the Pacific Northwest book, even though these don't really vary that much. Um, so we're using David James's uh, ventral shot, and there's at least one, maybe two other pictures in the book that I can't remember who they're by. Um, oh no, I, one of them is Brian Reynolds from Oklahoma, so we do have one. We, we do have a small handful of pictures in the book from him from uh, Oklahoma and North Dakota. And then a uh, funny coincidence is Bob was sitting in my living room, we were going over these pictures, and we got to Cabbage Whites, and we were bemoaning the fact that we couldn't find any. Uh, my friend, Mary, texted me and said, hey, look what just hatched out. <laughs> uh, well, they looked up in Twist, and it was November, and these things normally would be flying. It's, it, up there, they'd already have multiple crops, but they had harvested the cabbage out of their garden, and when they brought it in, a caterpillar crawled off and pupated on the wall of their kitchen, and they just left it there. And because it was warm inside, it hatched out a couple weeks later. And so I said, we need pictures of this, and they're professional photographers. So she went and found a cabbage leaf out of their fridge and stuck it on there so it looked sort of natural and got a picture of it. So it a normal male cabbage leaf. I'll never look at my picture the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as I said uh, earlier, Tim Press had given us some uh, guidelines on what photos they wanted, and then through my own experience, this is kind of what I've found, is you really need pictures that are 300 dpi or higher, and that's dots per inch. Um, a lot of photos, usually you're taking them in 600 or 1200 dpi or more. Um, higher, but if you're doing any post-processing, if you're cropping a picture, if you're not paying attention, sometimes you don't realize that the system you're using will actually decrease the resolution when it saves the image. It doesn't just crop it, it also makes it a smaller file size. So you got to watch for that. Um, DSLR, that's a digital single lens reflex camera. Those are nice big cameras with interchangeable lenses, uh, take really high quality pictures. iPhones, um, like I said, Timber Press didn't want any camera phone pictures, but the cameras on the phones keep getting better and better and higher resolution. And yeah, I think you take a lot of pictures with your camera. That was going to be one of my main questions. Why? The advances with cell phone cameras. I know. So, yeah, so there were a few. And we used some of your pictures that I, I think they're probably camera phone pictures. I asked for the phone with the greatest macro. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it and it's like I, I've got a, a new iPhone, and I think it's like six. I can't remember how many megapixels it is on there. It's probably more than that, 10 or something. Mm -hmm. But it'll be like, you know, a four megabyte file. Well, that's a pretty decent file. The problem with the phones um, is that they tend to compress the image more than a regular camera. So it can do really weird things with the color. Um, and if you zoom in, it's like uh, when you first look at the image on a computer screen, it looks just as good as a regular camera photo. But when you zoom in, you can see the graininess of it a lot quicker than you can when you're zooming in on a camera photo. Yeah, but who's zooming in on your field guides? Uh, yeah, you know, well, you know, art editors and publishing, they're this book, very picky. This book is written for them. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is RAW versus JPEG files. So if you have a DSLR camera, usually it'll take pictures in RAW, which is a digital negative. And you can do a lot more post-processing if you have that file. So when I take pictures, I have a setting on my camera where I can take it in both the raw file and it'll save a low resolution JPEG so it doesn't take up a lot of space on the card. And then when I upload them onto my computer, I can easily browse through all the JPEGs and I can post them on Facebook or wherever I want and they're just low resolution, ready to go. 
But then if I want a really good print quality photo, I can go to the raw photo and do some processing and clean it up a little bit and then use that. Um, and that goes along with Photoshop editing. It can be really great. You can do a lot with that, especially if you have a raw file. Um, but especially when you're dealing with nature photography, you need to be careful um, if you're being a little conservative with your changes. Because if you're doing a lot of things like adjusting saturation and vibrance, it can make the picture look a lot prettier, but it can decrease the value as far as looking at field markings and what the true color of that butterfly is. R-A-W, what does that stand for? Raw? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. That's, okay. that's just the abbreviation. It's Nikon and Canon both use that as, uh, that's okay. their raw. Um, Nikon is sometimes called N NEF file. It's probably the difference between kind of crude and highly refined, sort of raw versus cooked. Oh. That's the way I interpret it. Yeah. Well, it, it works that way, but I do, I'm pretty sure it stands for something, but I'm just not sure what. Like JPEG, that means something too, but I can't remember. Okay, and then the next few slides to wrap up the photo part, um, just talking about what makes a good picture. And I know a lot of you are really good photographers, you probably know all this already, but um, first thing is composition. You want to think about the environment around the butterfly and the position of the butterfly in that picture. So sometimes you get so excited to take a picture of this butterfly, you don't realize that there's blades of grass between your camera and the butterfly that you might not see because your eyes are kind of going around that, but it'll wind up looking blurry in your final picture. Um, other times I wind up taking pictures of butterflies and then looking at the picture later and realizing there's a spider right there that I didn't even know was there. Or there's a little colorful moth in the picture. And so I'm so focused on that one butterfly that you kind of tend to ignore everything around it. So if you spend just a, a few seconds kind of trying to do this quick composition and think about what's around you, um, maybe clear a little bit of the vegetation away if it won't scare off the butterfly. Um, try and get at the right angle so you know if the butterfly is on the ground you might have to lay belly down on the ground to get a really nice straight angle on that to get it nice and sharp. Um, lighting is really important uh, when you're out you're usually dealing with sunny days when you're photographing butterflies and if it's really really bright and sunny you can um, tend to get this really sharp contrast in your pictures it can make it a little bit difficult um, to get a good color on the butterfly or good exposure and so it seems a little counterintuitive but if you have an external flash on your camera you can use that on the brightest sunniest days and you can change your shutter speed and aperture and wind up with a much nicer picture because it kind of helps soften the shadows and so you're still using that ambient sunlight but the flash can help fill in the shadows. Um, sharp focus definitely. Uh, that's something that can be a lot more difficult with butterflies because they're tiny and your camera tends to want to focus on everything around it except for the one butterfly. Um, so just really working on trying to get that flat angle. If it's a dorsal shot, try to get it straight on, not at an angle so that all parts of the wing are in focus. Same thing if it's the ventral and it's sitting on the leaf like that, try to get it a bit right angles to it. And some examples here. So the top row are pictures that are nice and square on the butterfly, so they're nicely in focus. Um, the ones on the bottom, like this is the same butterfly, all three of these. But this one, I was just, I, I tend to take pictures as I get closer to the butterfly in case it flies off. Um, so even if I have a blurry picture, I can at least identify it. Um, so this one, I was standing up and taking a picture at an angle looking down on it. And so can't really get a good look at the ventral markings. You can barely see a little bit of orange on the dorsal. This one, I kneeled down on the ground and got straight in on the butterfly to get a nice uh, flat shot. And then that one, I was standing up as it was opening its wings and closing them. And I had to take several pictures before I kind of got one straight on like that. Um, this one again, I was practically laying on the ground and these butterflies are about this big. They're Bowers Blues. I got down in Southern Oregon this summer. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of them around this reservoir. It's amazing. First time I ever saw that species and see so many of them, it was so exciting. Um, but this one, any of you know what that is? It's so washed out. So this one, it was really, really bright and sunny, and I think I was using a flash and I had it set too high. 
And so it just washed it out and makes it almost impossible to tell what it is. Lilac bordered copper. So you can, you can almost make out the lilac, but it's so washed out, it really looks like purple copper. And so um, when, when you edit that, you can't bring the color out? If it's washed out, it's just if, gone? When I take it in the raw photo, you can actually change the exposure in, um, in Photoshop. And it's not like if you have a JPEG and you open it in Photoshop, you can change the brightness. That's not the same as changing the exposure. So the brightness just will wash it out or just make it darker. Changing the exposure will help. But sometimes if it's too washed out, you can't, you've lost that quality, and so you just can't get it back. You might be able to make it better, but you can't make it perfect. Can you get and then this one over here, as a cell phone picture, I took of a female varicose of copper, and my cell phone focused very sharply on all the leaves, but the butterfly is totally blurry. So at least you can tell what it is. It's not no, I can't. Enough. What what, uh, what are those leaves? <laughs> <laughs> I think those are wild strawberry. Looks like a yeah. thing. I was I was up picking huckleberries that day, and varicoses were all over the place. So, I, my friends have, d have figured out that the only way they can pick more huckleberries than me is to start pointing out caterpillars and butterflies. Ah. So, because I used to be known as the one that picked the most huckleberries, and now I'm not anymore. <laughs> Distraction. Um, okay, and then the last one here. Um, same butterflies. This is up on Chumstick. In fact, I think, Dave, you were taking pictures of the same pair on the same day. We were both kind of going around the <laughs> But, yeah, that's, um, but that's the picture you should have gotten. Yeah. Uh, but I just want to point out here, both of these pictures I think are great as far as you know, the clarity. They're both sharply focused on the butterfly. But just to point out to you the difference that the background can make. So um, I moved around so that there was a little bit different background between the two shots. Um, and I'm kind of hard pressed to figure out which one I like better. The other thing is that one over there. I think I had moved one of the flower heads out of the way so it's a little more focused on the butterflies. And the lighter background, they kind of stand out more. But the picture is a whole little washed out, so this one I kind of like covered better. But anyway, so it's just things to think about with your composition. Are they hugging each other? <laughs> sure, they're hugging each other. <laughs> So, yeah. Um, You're going to have a name for that in the book? What? Yeah, yeah, I got them on. Are the Euphoies on the correct movies? Uh, no. Okay. It's just Euphoies on correct movies. <laughs> Cascade Euphoe. Yeah. We're using your common names on everything. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I remember one more thing I was going to say here is one of the things that I loved for the book is. Uh, Bob and I were trying to pack as many pictures as we could, but Timber Press was also saying, you know, space is a premium here. Um, these are great two for one shots. When you're trying to get examples of males and females all in a book, it's nice when you can get them in one picture instead of two. <laughs> so there's quite a few mated pairs that are in the book. It is a little prairie, so. <laughs> well, like Sheridan's green hair streak. We've got two pictures in the book, and both of them are mating pairs, but they look slightly different. So we, we got a really nice example with just two pictures. We've got four butterflies and two forms of variation. So when one of them was John Bowman's picture, I can't remember who did the other one. Yeah, photograph everything, even cabbage lights. <laughs> and try to seek out the rare butterflies, but don't forget to photograph the common ones. We've had a lot of photos of big, bright, beautiful tiger swallow tails and new ballads, but not so many skippers. Um, and then pay attention to what's in front or behind of the butterfly. Make sure that you're not getting any leaves and things in the way. Also, even if there's not a leaf in the way of the butterfly when you're taking the picture, if you have an external flash and the leaf is in front of the flash, then that can tend to cast a shadow. So we'll watch for that too. And then also pay attention to what species you're looking at and how it's identified. So if it's a fritillary, we want dorsal shots because that is part of the butterfly, but we also need a ventral shot so we can verify the species in most cases. So even if it's a really blurry ventral shot and it's good enough to identify the species, then that's great. You know, so you, there was a lot of cases where we got dorsal fritillary pictures for the book, 
and we asked for ventral shots along with them that we weren't going to use, but just to verify the species. So, so that's it for Zoom. Photos, and now we're going to do um, mapping. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. This would be a real novice type question, but um, because the butterflies could be hard to approach, so you want to take a shot as soon as you can, what do you lose when you're a little farther away, but you zoom in on it, as opposed to hands and knees lying on the ground, trying yeah. to actually get the lenses close to the butterfly. Um, what do you really, lose by zooming? Yeah, if you have a really good zoom lens, um, sometimes it's not that big of a difference. You can still get, especially if you're a really good photographer, like Rip, Rob Santry and Dennis Holmes and some of these guys from Northern California that just, you know, blow me away. Uh, photos on Flickr. Um, Dave is really good at you know, getting good butterfly photos. Um, the, uh, when you're zooming, sometimes that will increase the shake in the photo so it can be harder to get a, a sharp focus. Um, so that's something you can watch for, but if you have a tripod or even a monopod that can cut down on that. There's also lenses that have built-in vibration reduction which won't completely get rid of it, but it will help. Um, so that, that's pretty much the biggest thing. Um, but yeah, like I said, I tend to you know, shoot pictures as I'm getting closer to the butterfly. So if it flies away, at least to have something. It might be a little bit fuzzy, but I might be able to crop it and you know, still use it. Do you do everything handheld or do you use tripod some of the time? Handheld. I've tried tripods and they just aggravate me. <laughs> I'm not very good at that, so and I'm still learning. I've got two of them trained on you right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and also it's just I, I tend to be torn between photography and collecting, especially if I'm in a new area that I haven't been to before. I'm going back and forth and I have a hard time figuring out which one I want to do. And so it's, it's one thing to have a camera around your neck and also be swinging a butterfly net, and it's yet another thing to also be trying to carry a tripod, so it's just too much, and I tend to wind up missing the butterflies instead of getting any pictures. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have already partially answered this by saying you don't like using a tripod, but do you uh, tend to prefer going after butterflies or going to a place like by a flower and leave for a butterfly? Uh, Usually going after the butterflies, but I will seek out areas like where I know that they tend to mud puddle or areas with, that have a lot of flowers. You know, I, um, if I see a lot of butterflies flying around and nothing's sitting still at the moment, I might just stand there for a while and watch them because eventually they'll come to roost somewhere. Um, and sometimes with like Orquid's admirals and certain butterflies that always come back to the same perch, if you figure out where they're perching and you just stay there, and wait until they come around two or three times, eventually they'll land right there and you can snap a picture. So, yeah. Anything else? Okay, so the rest of my talk is about mapping butterfly records, and I'm primarily going to be talking about one app um, that you can get on smartphones. And I've got handouts at the back that I mentioned that you guys can pick up if you're interested in learning more about it and using it. So why are maps important? Well, first of all, they give us a sense of direction. Um, especially in these days, everybody usually can pull out a phone and it'll tell them where to go down the street to the, their favorite restaurant. Um, it shows you where you're at in relation to your surroundings. Um, and yeah, you can have GPS in your car tell you how to get places. They're also important for research, so you can study how the landscape's changed over time. Uh, like if you have multiple aerial photos of a certain area over many years, you can see how the vegetation has changed. Um, you can see how you know, the trees may have encroached in an area or some area may have burned off, uh, things like that. You can also <coughs> use maps to generate research plots and uh, survey paths and then take it out in the field and figure out where those locations are exactly and collect data and then come back and plot that in the mapping system. This picture right here is actually an app that I made in my grad school days that's um, part of Johnson Prairie. Just a very rough map. The lines are the roads through the prairie and then the squares are my large uh, vegetation plots that are 20 by 20 meters. And they're uh, paired and you kind of make out what the pairs are. And we were studying effects of grass-specific herbicides on Puget Blue Butterfly 
and uh, some of the other butterflies in the area. So we would spray one plot in each pair, and the other would be the control, and we would go in there and um, do different surveys and butterfly behavior assessments and things like that. <coughs> And they're also important for data analysis. So once you've collected the data, then how are you going to analyze it and interpret what it's telling you? Um, you can study the distribution of the species in relation to other features like streams, um, topology. So you know if you have a whole bunch of records of a butterfly and you're comparing it on a map with contours, you can tell you know if it only occurs at certain elevations or if it's spread throughout that area. Um, things like that. And then this map here is one little extract out of my Simohican book. Uh, this is showing the species diversity on the Simohican. Uh, but I just wanted to point out some things. When you're looking at maps, you want to be thinking about um, potential bias and also uh, making sure that you're interpreting the map correctly, that you're not reading more into it than what it's actually showing you. So, in this case, um, you've got the circles that get bigger and change color as there's more species uh, recorded in a particular spot. Um, but just because there's no circles in those green areas, when you first look at this map, you might think, well, that's because there's no butterflies that have been recorded there. Well, is that because it's been surveyed and we haven't found any, or is it because we just haven't looked there? In this case, it's mostly because we haven't looked there. And then also the smaller circles are areas where we might have only surveyed it once on one day. And so you might just get a few species. But if you survey it multiple times, different times of year, um, and over several years, you can get a lot more. And some things to point out here is like right here, where you have the highest uh, species diversity. That's actually the headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got people there 24-7. They're always writing down what butterflies are there. They've got sprinklers on the wall. Are coming into the water, so yeah, we've gotten uh, mm -hmm. I think the full 55 species all from that one spot there, and there's 88, I think 88 species now um, total reported on the wildlife area. So 55 inch out of 88 is not bad. And then up here, those are higher density. Well, that's a road, so those are all areas that have been frequently surveyed several times along that road. And it's also a really good place in general for butterflies. Down in here, it's more just grass, prairie, shrub, step. Um, so really, there aren't as many butterflies there. But we also, because there's not very many, we don't spend a lot of time there. Because when I'm there, I have a limited amount of time. And I want to go where there's butterflies. So if I have more time in the future, things kind of slow down. You know, Up until now, I've been trying to get photos for my book records and everything, but now I can start trying to fill in these gaps in the future years and go in and see what's actually there. <coughs> Why do we want to track spatial butterfly records? Well, they're important for scientific research, number one. Uh, location data is crucial. You can do a lot with it. Um, it provides a consistent piece of data, so if you have multiple observers, everybody has their own uh, methods of uh, writing down observations, they have their own biases. Um, you, know, you might have one person that is more interested in the weather, and so they're writing down you know, the temperature, whether it's cloudy or sunny, and all of the wind and all that, and then somebody else might not care about the weather, but they're writing down everything about all the plants and the general habitat of that area. So if you're trying to compare that information, it's like apples to oranges, it's kind of hard, but if you have flat long coordinates or any other kind of coordinates, it's very consistent data. And so at least you can compare location um, across multiple users. And now it's really easy. So in our digital age, almost everybody has a smartphone or a GPS, something like that, that they can record information off of. Um, a lot of times we'll be in a group where at least somebody has that. And so you can all report your information to them. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. So how should you record data? So you see a butterfly somewhere, and you want to know how you need to record that data. First of all, you need the coordinates. Uh, latitude and longitude are preferred because they're the most universal and really easy to um, get into a lot of different systems. UTM, Universal Transverse Indicator, is, it used to be a lot more popular, not so much 
these days. One of the problems is that you need to know what zone you're in for the coordinates to make any sense. So like right here, we're in zone 10 in western Washington. Somewhere in the middle of the Cascades, you go into zone 11, and that's the whole eastern half of the state. So if somebody were to record UTM coordinates, but they didn't have the zone, you might wind up with a butterfly record in eastern Washington that actually came from western Washington. So, uh, but if you had lat long coordinates, you wouldn't have to worry about that. It's always going to be exactly in that spot. State plane is similar to UTM, it's just a different kind of projection, different measuring system. And uh, I don't know anybody that really uses that very much. Um, handheld GPS devices usually have it as an option. Um, and then elevation is not as necessary, but it does add to the usefulness of the record. So if anybody's you know, collecting all sorts of butterfly records, like John, yeah. How do you uh, get uh, elevation? How do you get elevation? <laughs> um, that's one thing that I don't think you can get on the Venza app. I was going to, I realized that I hadn't actually searched for it on there, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But you can get it off of a GPS, a handheld GPS device. Usually they'll have your elevation and all sorts of. Are those devices. accurate or are those uh, barometric? I don't know. I haven't actually tested that. I, I think know, they're before. accurate. From, yeah, I think they're from the satellite. Okay. Yeah, I think they're pretty accurate. They might be within, you know, 10, 20 feet or so, but that's not that big of a difference for elevation. Because um, I know I've had some records where I have the coordinates and the elevation off a GPS device, and then I've gone and plotted that in Google Earth, and Google Earth will also give you elevation, and the elevation's been different by like maybe 10 feet. Google so, is, uh, Google Earth is usually wrong. Usually wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I kind of suspected that. So. Yeah, like, it's like it shells in the Netherlands in certain places, right on the beach, so the sea level, you get elevations of minus three feet, which yeah. is on sea level beach, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, and then handheld GPS devices are probably the best way to go because that's kind of what they're paid for. Um, but I think as technology advances, like with the cell phone apps, we'll probably get it on there too. Um, Photos, if you want to take a picture of the butterfly and geotag it so it's tied with your location and any other information. Um, the most expensive GPS devices often have the ability to take a picture and save it with that waypoint, um, but they tend to be kind of out of the price range of people like, I don't want to spend a whole bunch of money on a GPS device, I'm not going to do that much when I can take a picture with my phone. And so this app allows you to take pictures and save it with your points in the app, and you can export them and actually view them in Google Earth with all your information. So that's kind of a handy thing to have. And that's the one you have tablets for? Yep. Oh. I'm going to go through, that's most of what my demo is going to be is talking about that app and then some other stuff too. But, um, so then you also want to think about what you're going to do with the data. I don't know if you guys recognize the people there. <laughs> that was the LEPSOC meeting in Leavenworth, the joint meeting with you guys. We've got Al there on the left, and um, I think that's Brian Schultons. He's a LEP guy from back east, and um, Ranger Steve's in a white shirt. This was up on top of Red Top Mountain when we were uh, accumulating all the records from everybody for that day. So, uh, are you going to send the information to a records keeper? Uh, if so, you need to figure out what their requirements are. So different people will maintain data in different uh, databases. Some use Excel, some use Microsoft Database. Some have very specific requirements on how they want the data organized. So if you want to do this consistently, then you need to figure that out ahead of time so you're not wasting a lot of time trying to convert your data into a different system. Um, do you want to view it in Google Earth just for personal use? Um, do you want to view it in ArcMap and create your own maps? We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, that's the program that I use. So that's um, what I do my career for money right now is I'm a GIS analyst. So I make maps is the simple way to put it. Um, but it's a lot of digital cartography, digital database management, data analysis, um, and that kind of thing. And ArcMap is the software that we use for that. Uh, yeah, so your export format depends on what you want to do with it, because all of these use different formats. So, briefly talking about handheld GPSs, um, like I said, they 
will have a lot of features on there, different projections that you can set them to, they'll get your elevation. Um, some of them will even take temperature and things like that. Uh, depending on the model, they can be more accurate and have more readings than a phone. But these days, the phones are getting so better, so much better that um, I really don't see that much of a difference between them. I've, we've gotten very high accuracy off of the phones. Um, the nice thing with these is they have a longer battery life than your phone. You're not having to recharge it all the time. And they usually run on AA batteries, which you can always bring some spares. And uh, the downside is that they have limited background features. So you can't get bigger ones that have color. Hang on, let me finish my thought. <laughs> Um, they'll have a color background and more detail on the screen. Some of them are even touch screen. Um, but usually you're just getting a tiny little handheld garment like this one is black and white. And unless you have a supplemental chip that you put in it with additional contours and things like that, you might only be getting your trails and major roads and stuff. So what was your question? Do, do GPS have dead spots? So you find places that you can't get a reading? If you're in very dense densely forested areas under canopy. Um, sometimes, you, if you stand there long enough, sometimes you can get a reading. But it can be more spotty, especially if you want it to track you, like if you want it to record your entire line, you know, path of walking. Um, if you get in a dead spot like that, it will eventually pick it back up again, but you'll wind up with these weird zigzags that will like go way out in the back, and so it might say that you hiked 20 miles when you only had 10. <laughs> so, you gotta watch for that. Do you use one of those, or do you just I use have one, and I, I used it for the past few years. Until now, I just use my phone with this app. Um, so this is what I'll talk about for the next several slides. So then the PDF Maps. This is a free app that you can get out of the Apple or Google Play Store on either Android or Apple phones. Um, there, when you download it and get in there and sign up, uh, you can register for free, you just uh, email and password, that's all you need. They will probably ask you if you want to get uh, Avenza Pro, which is a new uh, um, thing that they're offering. You don't need to do that. Um, that one you have to pay for, and the only advantage to that is if you're actually making your own maps in ArcMap and exporting those PDFs that you want to view them in here. So it's only for using your custom maps. So um, I actually work for a warehouser right now, and all of our foresters use this all the time. They're out in the field collecting information, and then they just email me the points, and then I go in and digitize everything and make a map and give it back to them. And I've compared it against aerial photos and very highly uh, high-resolution aerial photos and our roads that we've GPSed and everything, and almost all the time it's spot on. It's I've been impressed with how accurate this is, and that's why I switched to this myself because it's so much it's so much easier to use. Mm -hmm. Do you have to have a service provider uh, con contract with the phone company service provider for this, or does it take readings right up the satellites? It, yeah, was, I think that's my next slide. Um, oh, <laughs> it uses the built-in GPS in your phone. Actually, I do have that in here. Yeah, it uses the built-in GPS in your phone, so you you have to have a cell phone or cell provider ready phone, but you don't actually have to have a cell signal for this to work. So it just, um, you know, like if you had an iPad that was only Wi-Fi only, it wasn't set up to use with a, a cell phone provider, then that wouldn't work because the GPS isn't hooked up or something. I don't quite understand what that is. But if you have a cell phone that's just, you know, a cell phone ready phone or a tablet, then this will work. And I've used it way out in the middle of the woods where I was long time away from a signal and it still worked, took GPS points and everything worked great. Um, and I also like it because it's only one device to remember. You don't have to remember to throw your GPS in with you because you always, if you have a smartphone, it's always with you. <laughs> and you're always taking it with you because you want to take pictures with it. Um, and it's lightweight. A lot of times the GPS is even the tiny ones are heavier than most phones. So um, you just have one thing to remember, throw in your pack and you don't have to carry extra weight. Um, the downside, like I said earlier, is these tend to need recharging a little more frequently. So if you're using it a lot, you might run out of juice in the field. But I just bought a little external battery pack that doesn't cost very much money and you charge that up ahead of time. And it's usually good for at least three charges of your phone. And I just throw that in my backpack and I can plug in my phone. 
um, usually for short hikes, I don't need it. And if I'm in and out of my car a lot, I'm just keeping my phone plugged in my car. But on long hikes, long hikes, I will take the external charger. Oh, and then the other thing with this app, once you get in there, um, you can't, there are a few maps available for free that you can download, but most of them are available for purchase. And it will use your iTunes account. So if you have iTunes registered on your phone and you're purchasing apps that way, this charges you through your iTunes. It'll just show up as an iTunes charge on your credit card. So it's very easy. And the maps are very reasonable, I think. Um, they're all pretty much the same price as a paper map you get in the store. Some are a little bit cheaper. That? And then they get collected. Once you buy a map, it's in your catalog forever. Yes. So um, I think, yeah, when you first open up, I don't know if it'll prompt you immediately when you download it, or you might have to go into the settings. But uh, I highly recommend you set up a free account. You just give them your email and set up a password. Because when you do that, it'll save any maps you purchase to that account. So if you lose your phone or you buy a new phone, um, you just sign it. You just download Amenza, sign into your account, and everything will show up and re-download on that new phone. But if you don't do that, you're going to lose them. Um, so when we first open up the app, it's going to look like this first screen here. And this button down at the bottom is where you go into the store. It'll look like this. Um, and you can either browse for different maps, like go into the National Geographic Trails maps, which I think are really great. Um, or you can go find maps. And you can search over here for a particular area, or you can just pan around on the map. It's like flipping through uh, Google Maps or something to find where you're at. All the blue pins are the center point of all of the maps that are available in this area. So right here at Center on Mount Rainier National Park. And if you touch on any of those, it'll pop up a little window with a little information tab about the map. And you can hit that, and it'll go to more information. And you can decide whether it's something you want to download and purchase. Um, if you go to the list button up above, it'll just have a list of the map names instead of, instead of showing them on the map. And like I said, some are free, but most are about the same as a paper counterpart. Like if you buy a National Geographic Trails map in Cabela's or some other sporting goods store, you know, it comes in two sides. The maps on Avenza look exactly like that. All they are is the digital version of the paper map. And if you buy one map like that, it'll give you both sides. So um, I think most of these National Geographic maps are like $12.99 or something for both sides. So once, mm -hmm. How long did it take you to learn to adjust to the fact that you weren't looking at a big map, you were just looking at a small section of the big map? Uh, not very long. I look at maps all day long, so I'm kind of used to <laughs> all different scales. Um, I This is a lot easier for me to use than a GPS because you're tending to use like a little joystick thing or looking up and down to try to get it to move from one area to another. And this, you're just using finger swipes to move around, zooming in and out, just like everything you use on a normal phone. Much more user friendly. Do you carry a cape or a hood around? Do you look at this screen in the bright sunshine and actually see it? Yeah, sometimes I have to cut my hand a little bit, but usually you can just change the brightness of the, your phone screen and you can see it better. Um, yeah, so these here are examples. This is some of the maps that I have on my phone right now. All these ones that start with the number are the National Geographic Trails maps. They have a lot of different trail maps available, but I and I've tried like three or four different kinds, and I really do like these the best. I'm because I do GIS for a living. I'm kind of picky when it comes to symbology and how they uh, show things on a map, and I really like the way these are done. They're just very intuitive. You can usually figure out what it's telling you without having to look at the legend, which is a very important thing for maps. Um, they have. All the trails are very well detailed. They have different colors, like if it's a if it's a trail that is used for both bikers and hikers or uh, horseback riders, you know, they'll tell you that uh, has all the trail numbers and stuff. And the maps have these numbers in front of them. Uh, I found look over on the right there. Uh, it looks like the 200 series of trail maps are the national parks, like Mount Rainier, 
uh, Glacier National Park, those sorts of places. Um, the numbers 818 to 827 are mostly Pacific Northwest. All the 800 numbers seem to be West Coast, but those in particular in this area. Um, and as you can see over here, 822 is Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams. So one side is all Mount St. Helens and the other side is Mount Adams. 821 is Columbia River Gorge. One side is the east half, the other side is the west half. So I use those a lot. Um, uh, those are trail maps, but mm -hmm. if you're, say, doing the Simlahican, and it's not a trail, mm -hmm. um, would they have one on the Sinlahican? Uh, uh, not the Sinlahican proper, but you could get a map that would cover that area that you could okay. use. So, um, you know, if you want a trails map to help you navigate if you're out there hiking somewhere in an unfamiliar area, then of course you want one that covers that and has the trails in that area. Uh, a lot of times I'm in places like the Sinlahican or other places that I'm really familiar with and I don't need a map to tell me where I'm at or where I'm going. I just need a base map that I can plot points on to track my data. So I don't really care what the map looks like as long as it covers my area. And that is what I use these benchmark maps for. Um, there's one other thing I was going to say about So the benchmark maps, I'm sure since you all go on field trips and everything, you're familiar with the big gazetteers or the Atlas maps. Um, Benchmark and Delorme are kind of the two main brands. And Benchmark, uh, when you open up well, either of those, usually the first page or two will have a full map of the whole state on it. Benchmark sells those for $7.99 in the Venza store. They're not great detail for navigating when you're out in the backwoods. They have all major highways on there. But because they're cheap and they cover the whole state, these are my go-to map for when I'm like going to Colorado and I'm using detailed road maps, paper maps, so I can kind of navigate where I want to go to. I'm not using this for that kind of navigation. But I just want a cheap map that's like, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. I just need a map that I'm going to drop points on. So I buy the statewide benchmark atlas map. Oh, now I remember. The other thing I was going to point out over here is you have a little text here that has miles and a little arrow. This is telling you how far you are away from each map. So if you are in an area that is covered by a map in your library, it will say on map. So you can easily just scroll through there and pick the one that, it's, that you're currently standing on. Um, or you can tell which, you know, if you're driving somewhere, you can tell which map you're about to cross into. Or so these are the National Geographic Trails maps. You can see they have really good uh, hill shade and uh, contours on there, so it gives you a good idea of the elevation and all the drainages. It's got all the roads and the forest road numbers on it. Um, it's got the trail here. This is Grass Knoll Trail that I like to go to a lot down in Scamini County. And you can change the different, you can change the color of your pins. Um, the yellow ones are actually pins that I created in Google Earth and brought in to Avenza. So it goes both ways. You can export stuff out of it, but you can also bring things in. Um, and then when you want to drop a pin, so this is the center of your map. There's always going to be this blue bullseye there. If uh, you are, if you hit this compass arrow and it's blue, it'll center the map on your current location. And there'll be a big light blue dot there, or you'll see the light blue dot somewhere else, and that's, that's where you're at. And so it always drops a pin in the center. So if you want to drop a pin where you're currently standing, you need to make sure that it's centered on your location first. And then it'll, you can hit the pin and it'll drop it. Or you can pan around and say, I'm standing here, but I want to drop a pin over there. You can figure out where that's at on the map and center it and drop a pin there. And once you do that, there's a little pop-up. And it'll just have a default place mark one, place mark two. And you can edit all of that. And does that pin location give you latitude, longitude? Yes. Exactly. So somebody else could go to the exact same spot and say, this is where she saw that butterfly. Yep, yep. In fact, it's showing your lat, uh, lat long live right here. This is the center of the map. So if you center it on where you're currently standing, you could write that down if you want to. Or when you pin it, then it's going to save that. And it'll show up in the pin uh, attributes, which I'll show in a minute. Um, the other thing is, when you're dropping the pins, by default it shows the little pop-up. And if you're doing a lot, that covers up your map. And if you just hit tap outside of that, it'll turn all of them off. And then when you touch any of the pins, it'll pop up again. 
So then when you uh, touch on the little I buttons, it brings you to this. So this is the attributes of your pin. So up here, it would normally say place mark one. You go in here, you hit the X to clear it out, and you type in whatever you want. So if I'm in an area and I just see one butterfly species that I want to record, I'll just put the name of it up there. Or if I'm in an area and I'm seeing a lot of butterflies, I'll just give it some name that kind of describes where I'm at. And then you can go into the description and type in a whole list of species that you're seeing, notes about weather, whatever you want to put in there. Um, photos, this is where you can add a photo to your point or multiple photos. So that'll just uh, go straight to your camera roll. You can pick anything that you've already taken pictures of or um, it'll give you an option to take a picture right then and there. It'll switch over to your camera and take a picture and then it'll come back to here and attach it to the point. Uh, right here is where it tells you your lat long for that point. And here's where you can change the color of your icon. So now that you have your quotations, what are you going to do with them? Uh, 
Uh, like I said, you could do Google Earth, ArcMap, or tabular data, such as Excel or Microsoft Access. Uh, Google Earth is free to download. You can view it on your computer or your um, iPhone or your tablet. Uh, it's kind of cool because it's got the 3D topology and you can kind of fly through it and look at things. And um, it's got a whole range of photography on there, so you can use your little scroll bar to go back and forth. Um, ArcMap, $100 a year for home use license. So that's if you're just using it for personal use or any volunteer work, um, which I think is very reasonable uh, considering their professional version starts at $1,500 a year and goes up to past $7,000. Um, <laughs> but the only thing is that it, it has a ton of options, so you really need some training to be able to use it fully. Um, and I'm going to skip over some of this stuff a little bit quickly because we're getting kind of close and we'll only time for questions. Um, so in Google Earth, if you export your KML file, you save it to your computer, and all you got to do is double click on it, and it'll open it right up in Google Earth. So that's pretty easy. And it'll show in your layers over here. And if you want to save it in there, you just right click and say save it to your permanent features or whatever. Um, you can see all of your pins and what you call them. You can click on any of them that have photos uh, attached to them or other information. And when you're zooming around in Google Earth, some of you might have experienced where it tilts it all funny and gets the compass all turned around. Drives me nuts. So I'm always going up to view, reset, tilt and compass. Straightens everything back up. And this is just looking in Google Earth at the points that I have on the other map in the loops, in the Venza. And if you uh, go to the properties of any of them, then that's the dialog box. You see it's got the um, lat long coordinates right up there. Does it not automatically include your, your uh, description fields? It will. If I had, I didn't have a description on this one, but it would show up there if you had it. I'm pretty sure. You can also create points in Google Earth and export them out if you want. There's a little yellow button up there. ArcMap. Um, highly flexible, tons of symbology options. You can view and convert just about any data format, create all your own maps, save data, manipulate it, all that. Um, so if you are really invested in recording data, then this would be the way to go. And this is what it looks like. Just screenshot, so you've got all your data layers over here. This is the aerial photo of the Simlahican. Red border is the outline of the wildlife area. You've got fish life right here. And all the yellow points are all the butterfly records that Ty Stewart got there in 2006. Oh, and then over on the right is where you can see the, the attributes. So I've selected one of the points. And he actually recorded all this, I think, on a handheld GPS, sent me an Excel spreadsheet with the data in UTM coordinates. I was able to plop it into ArcMap, and all the points showed up, and all the data over there came directly out of that Excel spreadsheet. So, really easy, and then you do all sorts of stuff with it. So if you need to map non-point records, so if you went out and you saw a butterfly, but you didn't get a location for it, you can't, you kind of know where you saw it, but you can only narrow down the location to within, you know, a quarter mile or something like that can still be important information, um, but then how do you display that? Uh, skipping forward a little bit here. Um, this is what the maps look like in the Simulica. So these are subdivisions of the township range and section system, and the yellow squares in this little grid are quarter mile squares. And most of the data for the Simulica I have is point data. So I could have mapped the scale of the map. By the time I make the point big enough to really see it very well, it's you know like an eighth of a mile or you know close to that size. And so it didn't really seem uh, to you know I, did, I didn't think it would have been that much better to have the points. Plus I had a lot of data that I don't have point records for that I wanted to be able to map. So I decided to just get the best of both and have a small scale grid um, and map all the data that way. And that's just a little bit about PLS. 
LSS. You guys don't know what that is. That's how all of your land is divided. So if you ever buy a house, it's going to be subdivisions or lots that were broken down smaller and smaller pieces out of the square scale. So it's a, um, each of those squares is one mile by one mile. And this was the way they surveyed the entire <coughs> western U.S. back when they were first um, coming out here and settling it. Who would be interested in our maps of where we've seen things? If we go on field trips and we see butterflies, does anybody want to have that? John? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we have a database right now that's probably 25,000 strong, right? And it's still not enough for our state. So yeah, this guy here, right here, yeah. look at me. We've been talking about it. He's compiling all the data, and eventually we're going to work together so they get that into a mapping format. So we, you know, we have a full spatial and database. The first time you see one of those maps, you'll understand why it's important. Because all of a sudden, these butterflies, they occur in distributions that are visually recognizable, you know, and they're dots, each dot representing an actual occurrence. It's a beautiful thing. Is this something you're doing personally or in relation to an organization? It's called the Evergreen Brilliance, the Washington uh, Butterfly Survey. We invented it in the 1980s and it's still going strong. And that pile guy, yeah, he's in it too. And we, and we got her and, and, and this guy here. And, you know, and, I don't, maybe I'll be seeing some I don't know if this question is more for you or for John, but that is, uh, people have been collecting now long enough. Are, are people doing any diachronic geographical studies? Is it just a, like uh, the change in the populations uh, over time and where they're found over time? Well, that potential exists, but only when you have enough of a, of a sample size and a density size to have time actually mean something. Uh, people have been sampling butterflies in the Northwest uh, since the late 1800s. Uh, however, that density from the 1880s to uh, the 1930s was pretty, you know, pretty uh, slim. We, I wouldn't say that it was adequate to make a formulation, but uh, since the 1960s, yes, you know, we can definitely track um, changes uh, in, in, in diachronic. That sounds like a disease. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, we can do that uh, from that time. And of course, we're ongoing. You know, these young people are going to carry on the task. So yeah, in, in a quarter of a century, we'll have a, a real good idea of where all our butterflies disappeared and why. Anything else? Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question. Why did you choose the Sinlahakan to study? Uh, kind of chose me. <laughs> um, when I was an undergrad at Central Washington University, it's kind of this whole domino effect here. Um, my advisor, my um, major advisor in geography, she was actually next door neighbors to Dale Swedberg's parents. And Dale grew up in Ellensburg, but he was the manager of the Sunnahegan at the time. And he was just starting to survey everything that he could think of on the wildlife area. And he wanted uh, GIS interns for the summer to start mapping all of the fences and to build a GIS database of the wildlife area from scratch. And so he got one of Nancy's students one year, and my sister and I went up with her um, that summer for a few days to kind of check it out and see if it was something we would want to do the following summer, and we did. So that um, 2004 is when I interned up there for the summer. It's actually how I found out about Wabo because I didn't know about any butterfly groups until that point, and Dale was like, hey, so there's this butterfly group meeting in OMAC this weekend. Is that something you want to go to? I'm like, what? Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, showed up, and um, yeah, the rest is history. The rest is but, history. Yeah, so, but yeah, spending the summer up there, I fell in love with the place. It's just beautiful, and I was really starting to get into butterflies more at that point. I, Kind of started when I, you know, I'd always been interested in bugs, but I started focusing more on butterflies when I was about 10 or 11. And uh, I was 19 that summer, and so I still had a lot to learn, and still am learning. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I had that intern that summer, and I just kept going back. Almost every summer, sometimes two or three times a year. Uh, so 
sometimes a whole week at a time, just going up there and spending time up there and surveying butterflies and got all kinds of records from the wildlife area. Uh, got the only juniper hair streak that's ever been found in Okanagan County anywhere, mm -hmm. is county record and some beacon record. Um, records of butterflies that are, have been found elsewhere in Okanagan County, but you know, very sporadically are showing up at the same beacon. Melanie and um, Kim, 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 yeah, they were up there this summer and got a Tawny Edge skipper. That's the first record of that for the same beacon. Just in time for me to squeeze it into the book. <laughs> so I had to get, change my layout. It's like, oh dear, I've got this all done and I've got to add a nap and all this other stuff in here. So I got, got that all squeezed in there. Oh, yeah, I'm excited. I know. Took a little bit of rearranging, but I got it in there. So, yeah, all sorts of fun stuff. Dale is still determined to get up to 90 species, so we're working on it. But, and he's retired now, he's not going to the trip anymore, but he's still very much invested in that area, and he's been working now that he's retired to try to fulfill his dream of a uh, Simlihican, um, like a, a research or learning institute up there that would offer field trips and classes and all sorts of stuff, and so he's working on getting grant money and things Does like that. Does he live there now? Uh, he lives there? in Tenasket, yeah, yeah, which is nearby. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much.